when I'm not getting Snapchats from my near future self, and also my distant future self, I like to answer questions I get on YouTube, so let's get to it. As someone who follows your Instagram feed, I would like to ask, in your opinion, who is the Zlatan Ibrahimovic of Guitar World? So if you don't follow my Instagram account, y'all better get on that because it's always good rocking time. And if you don't know who Zlatan is, then I suggest you check it out because he's one of the most awesomely arrogant soccer footballers, players that you'll ever, ever see. And he posted this picture on Easter, which is absolutely fantastic. So uh, great question. Who is the Zlatan of the guitar world? I think the knee jerk reaction to that question would be Malmsteen, right? Because you know, the arrogance is there. The arpeggios from Hell Lessons are, are fantastic. But I, I think that the, the sense of humor is missing a little bit. So my answer is actually gonna be Justin Hawkins from The Darkness, who is the singer slash one of the guitar players. Uh, the Darkness is absolutely awesome. I remember seeing a rig rundown with Hawkins, whose look has changed drastically over the years. And uh, they're asking him like, what kind of pedals he uses. He's like, I don't really use pedals. And they're like, well, what about a delay pedal? And he's like, well, I don't need a delay pedal. If I want a delay sound, I'll just play a note and then play it a little bit softer every beat. <laughs> and he keeps a total straight face while he does it. So I'm gonna go ahead and say Justin Hawkins is the Zlatan Ibrahimovic of the guitar world. And I'm a big fan of both. Telly or Strat? The age old question. I think uh, a lot of people who watch the channel know that I like to rock the Telly and the Strat, but I think when it comes down to it, the Stratocaster is my absolute first love, even though, I kind of, I actually do kind of prefer the the Music Man Albert Lee just as a better all around guitar uh, in my arsenal. The Strat is it's just where my heart is. I feel most at home. I feel most natural. I'm just, I just think it's like the most beautiful looking guitar. Uh, nothing really compares to position four and position five as far as I'm concerned, which I really think should be position one and two. Let's be real. But. Uh, if you haven't played either of them, I suggest you really check them out because I actually didn't play a Telecaster, like really play a Telecaster for the longest time. And uh, as soon as I did, I actually, I, I just understood why so many pro players rock the Tele because I feel like a Telecaster is a more malleable instrument as far as like how your tone kind of approaches it. But there's something just so classic about a Strat that uh, I think I'm always gonna be a Strat guy. But again, I've got nothing but love for both guitars. So if for some reason you've never had a chance to check both of, out, both of them out, I strongly, strongly suggest that you do so. But that's the blues in a blues scale. So not one four five, but one three five. I think you do a disservice trying to tie this to a major scale. Once people learn the pattern on the fretboard for a blues scale, then the presence of one and three and five makes great sense. Especially since no one in the blues is playing a 1 4 5 progression. <laughs> no one in the blues is playing a 1 4 5 progression. What in the world is this guy talking about? <laughs> like, all the blues is just 1 4 5 progressions. <laughs> I don't know. This Salty Blues comment of the week, like, literally temporarily broke my brain <laughs> when I read it. No one is playing the one four five in a blues progression. Like, I feel like as I was reading those worlds, my whole world just like shifted and like turned into slow motion. <laughs> Please tell me where you get that thin guitar strap. Rock on. So I've actually gotten a lot of comments on this guitar strap that I've been rocking out in some of the music videos. Again, thank you for all the uh, feedback. Uh, I'll probably have another one come this weekend, hopefully. And uh, again, I'm happy with how it's turned out, so I appreciate all you guys checking it out. But I think this strap is absolutely the best strap ever, and it's so simple. While I don't believe it is 100% vegan, this is just the one that came with my strap. There's no frills about it, but I kind of have a bone to pick because I feel like the strap market is just bad out there. I remember when I was working at Guitar Center, I had my choice of any strap in the land, and I could never find like just a cool strap. Like they're all either kind of stupid or bulky or whatever. There is a huge glaring lack of just decent guitar straps out there. You see the same straps, the same like five or six straps that everybody uses. So that's why I just rock the super thin, durable Fender stock strap. But uh, again, if somebody wants to make some money, just make some cool guitar straps and uh, rock them out. Hey brother, looks like Richie found his way back to Ovation Guitars. Now I know you're probably sick of me singing the praises of Ovations. I was wondering what your thoughts are about his return to the product line and maybe, come, maybe some commentary on what is expected to be a new signature model. 
<laughs> All right, so in breaking news that is probably only important to Joe, Richie Sambora has returned to Ovation Guitars. <laughs> So if you don't know Ovation guitars, they make like pretty unique guitars actually and I I'm a fan of them I guess I don't think I'd ever own one because they have like that patented back if you've never seen them and they're kind of like a shallower body uh, With uh, like you got a patented back. They're, they're really interesting I think they sound good. They play great, but they don't sit great on like my leg like anytime I've played them They kind of like fall off a little bit so from a sitting and playing standpoint wasn't really my first choice, but really cool guitars and uh, they sound great and people like absolutely love them. Now, believe it or not, I did not know that Richie Sambora had returned to Ovation Guitars to make a signature double neck model. And I mean, I don't know, call me a hipster modern contrarian, but I just don't know that the double neck acoustic guitar market is as strong in 2018 as maybe it was in the 90s. <laughs> but I definitely appreciate them trying. So, uh, hey, Ovation, if you want to send me a Richie Sambora double neck acoustic guitar, I'm all for it, and uh, we'll feature it prominently on this channel. Led Zeppelin trivia, come on, we all know it'll be the greatest quiz ever. Also, I'll include a question for the QA. Not sure if it had been asked before, however, but how do you go about spicing up the covers you do with the girls on your channel? So I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, some of the acoustic covers I do with some of my friends. And uh, really, I just kind of try to like make an original-ish interpretation on some of the songs they give me. Because it's not like any of these girls will actually take the time to bother to learn the songs that I want to do. So the challenge is always prob probably taking some kind of basic song that they approach me with and trying to put somewhat of an interesting spin on it just to keep myself kind of engaged throughout the process of shooting a video. Now depending on how good your eyes are, I spice these chord progressions up with a lot of major seven chords, but it's really just kind of like, you know, like you wanna make anything you're playing your own, even if, you know, you don't have any ambitions to make your own stuff or whatever, whatever you're doing, try to impart something that is you into any kind of arrangement for guitar. And for me, in the acoustic setting with some of the girls that I perform with, I just really kind of dig uh, extended chords, like, you know, whether it's, Minor seven, I play a lot of minor 11 chords, two major seven chords in it. And it's kind of like trying to find something interesting rhythmically that I can try to like lock into, which I, I'm really lucky that I have like some really awesome singers that I get to work with. And it's always, it's been a very eye-opening music musical experience to trying to lock into them while we're doing it. So a lot of it is just taking a, what I think are you know my go-to chord voicings on acoustic guitar because I don't really use those same voicings as much in my electric guitar playing. So that's kind of like my voice on that instrument in that setting, which I think works well. And just trying to find some kind of rhythmic adaptation of it that keeps me interested in it. And I feel like throughout that process, I've helped refine what I feel is like my own guitar voice. So I'm not saying that you should try to copy or replicate any of that, but whatever it is, even if you're just playing a tried and true basic song that is like super simple, you've been playing forever, just try doing something a little bit different and try to spice it up a little bit. Like if it's an A minor in a chord progression, make it an A minor six, make it an A minor nine, make it an A minor 11, A minor seven, replace an A minor with one of those uh, like riffs or licks that I kind of talk about a lot. So that's just kind of my philosophy on acoustic interpretations, as it were, and uh, I'll keep doing it, so stay tuned. Thoughts on recording analog versus digital? So this is always a very interesting question, and this is something that I used to be way more into when I was kind of just first learning the ropes of like recording production techniques. And now that I've been doing it a little while, I'm starting to get decent, more decent at it, I, I guess. I kind of am not as into the analogness as I used to be. I remember it was, it got to the point where I was on Craigslist and someone in town was selling like one of those Tascam tape machines. And I was like, you know what? I think I might want to incorporate that into my rig. And then I did some research and I was like, you know what? Enough is enough. Like, why don't I just try to make the stuff that I have sound good? So if, if you think of like an analog setup versus a digital setup, Pretty much anything modern is gonna be digital. Anything that goes through any kind of conversion where you're actually getting some kind of recorded sound into a computer, there's gonna be some digitized component. Like a, like a pure analog pathway, which, uh, you know, all the, all the blogs are talking about Tool and the new album and recording it with Joe Brisi, who I absolutely love, a great producer. They're going all analog, so they're keeping everything 
uh, you know, in the analog realm. So they're recording to tape. They're not really like using Pro Tools and stuff like that. Now, again, a lot of it is just because I've never really had access to any of like the good, good analog stuff, just like really cheap, high maintenance tape machines that I just don't have the experience or really the desire to get into it. I'm so much more locked in on trying to like just make the best analog performance I can get into the digital box. And I feel like my recordings have gotten a lot better, just kind of just focusing on making the performance better instead of just trying to like mess with the gear. Because for years I was like, I just gotta upgrade this and upgrade this piece of gear and this piece of gear. And I, I mean, you probably can even tell like, stuff off the Peridor album sounds fine. You know, and that was like a, a good attempt. That was definitely like the best I could do at that time. But I think the newer stuff definitely to me, is a marked step in the in the right direction, and uh, the gear is no different at all. So that just goes to prove that it's not what kind of gear you have, whether it's analog or digital. It's just kind of like learning how to use what you have, and then just trying to get the best results out of it. Because you know, there's so many like of the top level pros who are all in the box, as they say, uh, digitally speaking, and you know, they they just get awesome awesome results that just sound great. So, you know, if you're a gearhead and that's something you're into, my hat's off to you, that's awesome. I just know personally that's a rabbit hole that I'm gonna try my best to not go down again. And I'm gonna pretty firmly stay in the digital realm, just trying to get it to sound as good digitally as I can. So for listening homework, we're gonna throw it to my man, Justin Hawkins in the darkness. Probably the most feel good rock band of the modern rock age, I guess is what I would clarify at it. So I'm gonna link you one of my favorite songs. I encourage you to check out as many Darkness music videos as you possibly can, because it'll just be a great, great time. And as always, any questions or comments you have, sign up for the Blues Letter. Uh, I'm gonna link it to you below, because I just launched the first one of those, which, uh, you know, it's pretty fun. So do that. Hit me up on Instagram, Twitter, the comment section, or the website, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot.